Hello everyone and welcome back to Microsoft Flight Sim 2020 where I'm going to take a look at the Boeing 247 from Wings 42. This is a plane that I've been eagerly awaiting. It is, uh, well I can say right up front that it's certainly well worth the price considering it's only $20. Uh, at least as far as planes go that's rather cheap. I have been eagerly awaiting it because I have another Wings 42 plane that was the Blario 11 and I know that that felt very convincing as far as Blario 11s are concerned. It tried to kill me, which is appropriate. Uh, so, yeah, with these old planes, you do expect things to go wrong, and we will see about this plane in the future. But this has got all sorts of bells and whistles as far as the plane is concerned. It's got a nice little uh, checklist pad here. Instead of using the normal uh, weight system that we have in the game, uh, this thing, uh, it's better to use uh, this payload and weight uh, uh, system so we can fill seats here and add fuel to the tanks and top off the oil and stuff stuff like that and yeah well let's just have a whole bunch of people in and increase the baggage so there's that sort of deal and then the next and we've got wheel chocks uh, passenger stairs can be placed and then they actually have uh, crew people the uh, passenger stairs have been placed. Oh, it's there. So there, you can have passenger stairs placed. It takes time to do it uh, for realism and everything. And the engine startup, I tried it. I couldn't get it to work right. So it's not as simple as it has here or in the manual. And there wasn't a dedicated startup procedure thing. Uh, there isn't a... Well, that's not the wrong right thing. Uh, there isn't a dedicated checklist here to make sure that everything is in the right, that I didn't want, uh, right position. So, yeah, um, I'm, I, that's why I'm not doing the colon dart start on this. I haven't figured it out yet. Uh, but uh, it's actually got a crank to wind up the flywheel and everything. So you actually have to crank it up. So there's maintenance and apparently there's persistent maintenance. So that is a thing that they've coded. And uh, oil. You can get oil changes. So this is pretty serious stuff. The pricing philosophy as far as they're concerned seems to be that they intend to sell quite a lot of them. So they decide they might as well price it cheap. <laughs> because, uh, well, they'll, they'll recoup their money that way. So I hope more uh, developers of add-ons for Flight Sim take that same approach. But anyway, uh, let's see how it sounds and feels. And uh, we've got the United livery. There are a bunch of liveries. Uh, one minor, minor regret, regret that I have about it is that they don't have the livery of perhaps the most famous version, which is the version that flew in the McRobinson Air Race. Uh, that was, I think it was from uh, London. Oh, well, no, it was from RAF Milden Hall. Uh, down to Melbourne. It was a long-range air race. It was eventually won by the de Havilland 88 Comet, but the Boeing 247D flew in it, flown by Roscoe Turner, who was a fairly famous pilot, and Clyde Edward Pangborn. And that was the Warner Brothers Comet version, but it was a specially modified one. So this is the city of San Diego from United Airlines. Now you can see, well, I don't... I wouldn't have anticipated anything better than this. It's got all the rivets and everything. So, yep, you can see from inside. Okay, so let's take off. That's the wheel brake. Uh, actually, that uh, it starts with it off, so I just put it on. Really, unless you're at full thrust, it's not gonna move at all. It is a tail dragger, obviously. The undercarriage sound is serious, and there's plenty of wiggle on the dials. Uh, you see, they sort of vibrate a bit. The panel itself also vibrates. Okay, gear sound. Don't expect this thing to climb very quickly. And I'm gonna pull back out of the red region on the manifold pressure. So uh, the manifold pressure gauge is actually very nice. It's got a red region and 32s for climb, I think. 
and RPM I think was 2100 for climb. So yeah, they've got a primer thing here, but they didn't really explain how to use it. And then the fuel gauges work in an interesting way. Let me get rid of the yoke for a sec. Um, you actually pull and release this plunger to get the fuel reading. So we're at 112 gallons or so. So, and then there's this other one. Uh, the left tank is a single big tank. The right tank has a main tank and an auxiliary tank. So that's why the right tank on this gauge is visually uh, has less fuel. But we can switch that. We can switch the oops switch the tank selector to the main one and then when we read it we'll get the level in the main one so yeah that's what this fuel quantity gauge selector thing is to select between the two right tanks there aren't any flaps on this so yeah that's just how it is I decided to fly around uh, Seattle. We're actually higher than I wanted to be already, so let's send. Initially, it, uh, when you're controlling it, it feels stiff and heavy, but then when you get past a certain point, it turns faster. So if you apply constant pressure, initially it turns slower and then it hits a point where it turns faster, which is somewhat desirable anyway. It's not particularly loud and raucous now. Now, uh, when the gear is out, it's pretty, pretty wobbly and vibrating and everything. Um, they said so on the no, not you. The checklist. If you go back to the first page. Uh, it says carburetor heat above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And. Uh, one, one interesting thing is, so there's this engine temperature gauge selector, and if you can see very carefully, there's actually multiple readings per engine. So there's left engine, there's reading 1, there, uh, it's reading 250, uh, reading 2, uh, well, there's a number 4 there, and that's a little bit lower, and then C, I assume, is the carburetor, and that's very low right now. Uh, but if we turn on the carburetor heat, and just I'll just put it all the way up to hot. We'll see it heating up there to about 100 degrees, as a matter of fact. Well, oh, there's a space needle. It's very easy to fly. In fact, it was for a trip, tail dragger. It's very easy to get off the ground and even taxi. Well. Century Link Stadium or Field. And Safeco Field. Not the handcrafted renditions, but good considering its photogrammetry. There's probably some scenery pack that improves the harbor area for Seattle. Yeah, so navigation is sort of one of the big features here that I'm not really playing around with yet. And it's got a unique radio navigation system that they developed. And the main manual says a whole lot of very important things, but the big manual is for the radio navigation system, so I'm gonna have to go through that and figure out how that all works. Because uh, I would like to uh, learn how to use it. And yeah, that will be interesting. They've got all sorts of vibrational wobbles going on with uh, some of the. You can see the little fuel gauge wobble. Yeah, I. Well, um, this is the first time I've flown a Boeing 247 in a sim. I aim to fly everything in the sim eventually, but 
Uh, well, this is as good a version as I could have hoped for. For my first try. Aside from the PMDG DC-6, I don't think there's a higher quality plane that I've got right now. Well, I think we can see SeaTac right there. Lots of airliners around here, obviously. If you haven't noticed, I'm more or less a 1920s pilot all around. I just, uh, whether I'm flying in the Concorde or something else, I'm a barnstormer. So, <laughs> I don't, I don't go in for all these. I'm not a, I'm not an autopilot appendage. And this, I do not believe has an autopilot, so that's fine by me. I'm not sure what the undercarriage limit is. There's another plane there, isn't there? You know that, that middle runway doesn't seem to have a plane on it? Yeah, I don't know what the undercarriage limit is, but I'm gonna drop it here and you'll hear it and see it from the external view. It's pretty slow. It creates a lot of drag though. You can see the airspeed going down. And this is its sound while we're going at high speed. And it sort of vibrates the whole thing because of the drag. Oh, is that a plane taking off? I don't know, I got to start right. Uh, maybe because I was turning. Okay, well, I'm gonna try and go underneath the plane that's taking off there, if that's the plane that's taking off. Hopefully, hopefully he gets off the runway. Okay, no, I think he's he was landing, I guess. Okay. Uh, I don't know what that plane is doing, so... Hopefully that plane is faster than us. I think it's just sitting there, so it's not fair. Okay, we've hit the ground. That's us hitting the ground. see what's happening with this other plane out here. Yeah, it's just static. Um, or it's moving really, really slow. Wow, we, we bounce a lot. It's like the KSC runway. Um, I'm just gonna be a plane that lands on an airfield. Oh, my, my engine died. Oh, I, I throw down too much. Well, I guess that tells us something, huh? I'm just gonna park right here. Okay. So, as far as starting the engine again is concerned, <laughs> I guess we can talk about that. Um, so there's the wind-up flywheel thing. And I don't know, because it didn't say exactly where I should have the... I mean, I assume mixture is full, and uh, but the throttle sometimes they might want it about twenty-five percent. I'll do twenty-five percent and see. A uh, carburetor heat should be off, I guess. So yeah, maybe the oil shutter lever should be some other way. But anyway, the assisted start has this wind-up fly flywheel for us. Otherwise, we just check mark those, and then um, so the assistant is putting in the starter crank after putting in up the ladder and there's the starter crank and so we could click and hold that in order to crank it I've tried that too but I couldn't quite get it to work okay and then when it's okay it has this in green mesh flywheel which in theory should start the thing but yeah I'm missing something about how to do that so um, I checked the manual and I didn't see anything but it was I, I was Pretty quick in perusing it. We'll try full throttle. I don't, I'm not sure. 
I mean, in theory, the fuel should be feeding because we just had the engines on, right? Everything else should be configured properly unless they should be in some way other than regular flight. Uh, it does have a percentage here for winding up the left engine flywheel, but that means that at 100% that person stops trying, so... Yes, I tried that too. Uh, mesh... When I click mesh flywheel, it has a percentage for that, but that just, again, 100% is just when the person stops, not when the person succeeds. Uh, I can open the window. I don't know if that helps anything. Anyway, so, yes, starting the plane is something that I will have to work on. It's, I mean, it's not got a whole lot of flick switch procedures to it, but I think maybe I need, I'm definitely missing something. So, anyway, we will learn. But for now, we are here. It looks good. And with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.